Welcome to our webinar on transparency, human rights, and procurement. Today we'll talk about some basic questions, beginning with whether U.S. agencies can legally source their goods in the procurement process from high-risk countries, that is to say, high risk of human trafficking, forced labor, child labor, discrimination, and other internationally recognized human rights. A related question is whether there is sufficient transparency in the U.S. procurement process to know whether or not uh, goods are coming from high-risk countries. Our webinar today will include myself, Bob Stumberg from Georgetown Law School, Nicole Vandermeulen from ICAR, the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, Sophia Browning from Georgetown Law, also the Harrison Institute, and Joe Vukovic also from Georgetown Law at the Harris, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, the Harrison Institute. Here's our agenda. We'll begin talking about government procurement and human rights. What is the connection? Secondly, we'll talk about the need for transparency based on two case studies. We'll look briefly at seafood supply chains, and then Sophia will talk about Buy American Laws as a good place to look for information about when it is legal to source goods from high-risk countries. Sophia will pass the baton to Joe, who will talk about the Transparency Act of 2006. When we looked around for some of the best models in the world for legislation that requires transparency, we found out that the Transparency Act in the United States is in fact one of the best. That's the good news. The bad news is that it has not been implemented as Congress intended. We'll conclude by talking about next steps, ways to encourage congressional oversight, and to provide a path for nonprofit organizations to encourage the federal government to implement full transparency of U.S. procurement. So I'm going to pass the uh, computer now to Nicole, who will talk about procurement and human rights. Hello, my name is Nicole, as Bob mentioned, and I work for ICAR. Um, ICAR is a coalition of about 37 organizations that include labor, human rights, development, and environment organizations, um, such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and Investors Against Genocide. Uh, ICAR advocates for governments to adopt and enforce laws and policies that increase business respect for human rights um, throughout their operations. One of the major touchstones in our work in this area are the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Uh, the UNGPs were drafted by Professor John Ruggie uh, after extensive consultations with business, civil society, and government. They were then passed uh, unanimously by the Uni United Nations Human Rights Council in 2011. The, United Nation, the UNGPs are important because they state that um, the state has a duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business, and that businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights throughout their operations. Of particular relevance to the procurement context, the UNGPs also state that the state duty to protect is heightened when a state business nexus exists. And this includes when the state enters into a commercial transaction with a business enterprise. Because of that heightened duty and because of the leverage that governments have through their purchasing power over businesses, ICAR um, is uh, focusing some of its work on public procurement. This work was launched back in 2014 when ICAR and the Harrison Institute published Turning a Blind Eye, which was written by three professors, including Professor Bob Stumberg, who's on this webinar with us today. Turning a Blind Eye uh, provided an analysis of gaps and opportunities for the incorporation of human rights considerations into the U.S. federal procurement process. And in Turning a Blind Eye, we focused specifically on four high-risk sectors that accounted for 11.6% of federal procurement. In that report, we highlighted that within these sectors, the U.S. government is purchasing goods and services from global supply chains. And these are the same global supply chains that have documented instances of adverse human rights impacts. For example, low wages, excessive work hours, you can see them on the slide um, with the relevant sectors. Turning a Blind Eye also provided a policy menu across all six stages of procurement that identified different options for the United States federal government to incorporate human rights considerations into the procurement process. 
And one of those, one of the main ones that we focused on was supply chain transparency. As a follow-up uh, to Turning a Blind Eye, ICAR and the Harrison Institute are partnering with several European organizations um, and academic institutions to create the International Learning Lab on Public Procurement and Human Rights. The Learning Lab is a network of NGOs, academics, uh, government institutions, uh, policymakers, and national human rights institutions and others. And its purpose is to create a space for dialogue between these actors about innovative practices that already exist uh, that incorporate human rights abuses into public procurement, obstacles to further innovations and obstacles to spreading those innov innovations to other contexts and ways around those obstacles. In fact, we held our first workshop back in November of 2015 in Geneva, and it was attended by about rep representatives from about 16 governments and about 40 NGOs and academics. One of the main things that we learned while at that workshop were that there are certain governments that are already leading the way in this space. Uh, for example, the United Kingdom on contract clauses, specifically in the electronic sector, Norway on risk assessment, and Sweden on human rights due diligence. So our goal is to take these innovative measures and have them spread to the larger economies um, and also to find new ways to incorporate human rights abuses into public procurement. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back over to Bob. Thank you, Nicole. Before we jump into our version of supply chain transparency, it will help to think about the different kinds of transparency. For example, uh, many of you watching today are familiar with the California Supply Chain Transparency Act, which in turn served as a model for the UK Modern Slavery Act. Um, these models have been replicated in bills that are now pending in the US Congress by Representative Maloney and Senator Blumenthal. We refer these to these as tell us what you do transparency. They require companies to disclose uh, the policies that they follow to uh, prevent violations of human rights and the promises they make to the public uh, that they are following up on their policies. The second type of transparency is what we call transparency of the government supply chain. The precedent for this has been set by private companies like Nike, Levi Strauss, uh, and supply chain management techniques of companies like Walmart. Uh, it has been picked up in the public sector by cities including Madison, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. So supply chain transparency of the government's own procurement process. Related to this is the importance of beneficial ownership, which is to say, for any particular company or brand, who owns that brand? Who benefits from the profits and the commerce generated by a particular brand? Uh, if that is not transparent, then it's not possible to, to, chase the, uh, to trace the supply chain. And finally, there's transparency in the nature of compliance, which is to say, uh, whether a, a supplier is providing information on the results of its monitoring and audit of the factories or other uh, sources that serve its supply chain. Uh, one of the early uh, models for doing this was the ILO's Better Work Program, which originally was based in Cambodia and has now moved on to additional uh, developing countries. In addition, the United States government, through, through the Open Government Partnership, has promised to make uh, transparent information available for uh, compliance of its major suppliers in terms of domestic law, for example, uh, workplace safety violations. Today we're going to be focusing on supply chain transparency, that is the government's own supply chain. Let me transition now into one of our two case studies. Very briefly, I want to talk about seafood supply chains. In the summer of 2015, the New York Times and the Associated Press published dramatic exposés of the seafood industry in the South China Sea. These newspaper accounts revealed gross violations of human rights, including slavery, on the trawlers that harvest seafood, as well as in the factories in the industrial zone just south of Bangkok, Thailand. At the request of the Senate Caucus to Prevent Human Trafficking, my program at Georgetown, the Harrison Institute, uh, did an estimate of US government procurement based on several sources of data, and we found that approximately $300 million of US government procurement of seafood and related products uh, could be attributed to the supply chains where slavery is uh, 
is proven to be practiced. Based on information from US government procurement data, which is available on the webpage called usaspending.gov, we combine that information with US customs data and reporting from the Associated Press and the New York Times to map several different supply chains. We did this as a, as a case study to see how much work it would take to map an individual supply chain and to see whether the US uh, databases were sufficiently transparent. We looked at two Thai companies. One is Thai Union Frozen Food Products, uh, which is um, a company identified in uh, California-based litigation uh, based on the California Supply Chain Transparency Act and the California False Claims Act. Thai Frozen, excuse me, Thai Union uh, is a supplier of Costco and other US retailers. The data showed that from Thailand, the goods are exported to the United States through ports on both the West Coast and the East Coast. We also looked at a company called C, excuse me, CP Foods, which is a defendant in a claim uh, brought against Nestle and other companies, again, under the California legislation. We traced the supply chains from Bangkok to ports on the East Coast and the West Coast. From there, the picture becomes more complicated, uh, involving at least 350 agents and over 5,600 shipments um, within a seven year period. Using similar data, we were able to plot the supply chain from the US government through its own procurement process back to uh, the South China Seas and supply chains that involve slavery. So the degrees of separation between the US government uh, and the slave trawlers looks like this. The government buys from Cisco Systems who are serving government contracts in 14 states. Cisco buys from Stavis Seafoods, a Boston-based wholesaler. Stavis buys from Kingfisher, a, an exporter based in Bangkok, Thailand. Kingfisher buys from the factory south of Bangkok, the factory buys from the shipper, and the shipper buys from the slave boats. And again, it took four different sources of data to put this supply chain together. Um, it took a great deal of effort, but it is possible. From this experiment, we learned that usaspending.gov, the database which grew from congressional legislation passed in 2006, the, the Federal Transparency Act, um, is actually getting worse over time, not better. Last year when we looked at this database, we saw that contractor profiles included the top awards for each agency, recipient locations, types of contracts, the products sold and the top subcontractors for each major supplier. By comparison in 2015, only lists of contracts and the totals for those contractors were available. So usaspending.gov um, does not provide what transparency requires, which is to show subcontractors, um, to enable a search of all subcontractors, both foreign and domestic at the same time, and to enable word searches for high risk products. Let me shift over now and ask Sophia to begin talking about uh, the laws in the United States that require the US government to purchase goods made in the USA. I'm Sophia. I'm going to be talking about the Buy American laws and domestic content restrictions. And I'm going to be using apparel procurement from 2015 to answer the question, can the US legally source from high risk countries? And what impact do these domestic content restrictions have? How much of apparel procurement has to be sourced in the US? How much can be sourced in high risk countries? And how much of the picture can we just not really see from the data that's available on usaspending.gov? So first to give you a brief background of the domestic content restrictions that are applicable to apparel procurement, there's the Berry Amendment, which applies to the DOD, and the Trade Agreements Act, which applies to all other agencies. And at first blush, we can break down total procurement, which was over a billion dollars, by these two categories, looking first at Department of Defense procurement, which was 935 million, and the standard under the Berry Amendment is 100% manufactured in the United States with source materials that were produced in the United States. So it's a very strict standard.
And then all of their agency procurement was 207 million, and that's under the Trade Agreements Act. And that bubble is a little more questionable. It's straddling the line here because those products can be manufactured in either the United States or a designated country using source materials from anywhere. And there's some concern with this designated countries list. That includes all U.S. trade partners, and there are some high-risk countries that are U.S. trade partners, including Honduras and the Dominican Republic. And that list also includes certain least developed countries, including Bangladesh. And then both of those laws have small contracts exceptions that move a certain amount over to the Buy American Act. And the Buy American Act requires that the product be manufactured in the United States using 50% US produced materials. So 50% of materials could be sourced in high risk countries under Buy American as well. And through a small contracts exception to Buy American, $2 million for procurement are already out of any restrictions and into the completely high risk bubble at the bottom of the screen. There are several exceptions that we're going to go through that really change the size of these bubbles. The first is the non-availability exception. Any product under DOD procurement under the Berry Amendment that is determined to be non-available in the U.S. in sufficient quality or quantity technically moves over to the Trade Agreements Act, but U.S. trade agreements specifically exempt Department of Defense procurement of apparel. So all of those contracts move out into the bottom, the Made Anywhere section. And that is not quantifiable using USAspending.gov. Another concern under the Barry Amendment is non-compliance. A study from September 2015 showed that up to 48% of Barry contracts simply didn't have the necessary provision in them. They didn't say that it had to be 100% U.S. Um, manufactured and produced. So not having that contract provision, those contracts can be sourced anywhere. The TAA also has an exception that le leaks over to Buy American, which is any contracts with prison industries and Ability One. And that is partially quantifiable using, using USA Spending Gov, but it's very time intensive and very difficult to come up with that number. And then Buy American has two exceptions that, as well that leak out into the Made Anywhere bubble. The first is that Buy American is not a requirement, it's a price preference, and it's a price preference of only 6%. So if a domestic offer which means that it was the 50% U.S. materials and also manufactured in the U.S., not necessarily that it was a domestic contractor, but that it meets those requirements. If that offer doesn't win the 6% price preference, then the foreign offer, which is the offer that has the non-compliant materials, um, the foreign offer can be sourced anywhere. And we have no data on how many Buy American contracts are won by a foreign offer. And then again, non-compliance is a concern. The same study showed that up to 38% of Buy American contracts didn't have the necessary provision and so may be sourced anywhere. So in the end, the picture is quite different. The Barry Amendment bubble is down to just about half of what it was, whereas the high-risk bubble at the bottom of the screen, combined with the high-risk designated countries in the TAA, is more than half of all procurement last year. So some major takeaways from this, First, it is legal for the U.S. to source from high-risk countries. And then given all of these exceptions, most of which we can't quantify, around half of apparel procurement last year may have been sourced in high-risk countries, and that number could be even higher given the exceptions that we don't have data for. And the problem here is the transparency gaps. We can't see enough data about these contracts to see if they meet these exceptions and these requirements these gaps, as we mentioned, are in some of the exceptions. They're in the laws themselves with the price preference under BAA and with the source material um, exceptions under both Buy American and the Trade Agreements Act. And then finally, there's non-compliance. There's two types of non-compliance. There's the fact that 38 and 48% of these contracts don't have the necessary provision, so it's very unlikely that they're compliant. And then there's contracts that may have the necessary provision, but we can't see all the way down the supply chain to see where the product was ultimately sourced to know if they were in fact compliant in practice. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Joe, who's gonna talk about a potential fix for some of these transparency problems. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Vukovic, and as Sophia said, I'm going to be talking to you today about the Transparency Act, otherwise known as the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006. And the goal of the act, as one senator put it, was to create the Google of federal spending. So what exactly did he mean by that? Well, the act requires a publicly searchable website with data on federal awards. And federal awards is just a phrase that is used within the act to refer to categories of federal spending that include grants and subgrants, and most relevant for today's discussion, contracts and subcontracts. So for each recipient of a federal award, uh, the website requires, the law requires that the website have certain information, including the name of the recipient, the location, and the purpose of the award. So for a contract, that would be the name of the contractor, where they're located, and what the purpose of the contract is. And in addition, if the place of performance of the contract is different than the location of the contractor, then that would have to be noted as well. So you can begin to see why someone might refer, might refer to this as the Google of federal spending, because the idea when you add all this together is that anyone, any member of the public or Congress or a staffer could go to this website and using simple search terms could identify information about federal spending and contracts and could judge for themselves whether or not they thought that federal money was being used wisely and effectively. So I've told you briefly what the act does, but why was the act passed? The primary goal uh, was to combat waste, fraud, and abuse. And at the time the act was passed in 2006, recently there had been several high profile scandals involving the government overpaying for goods and services, particularly with respect to uh, Hurricane Katrina relief. There, there had been some disclosures where the government had vastly overpaid for that. And when the law was passed, there was very broad bipartisan appeal. It passed with unanimous consent in the Senate and under suspension of the rules in the House of Representatives. And it's not that difficult to see why it would be so appealing because you and I might differ about how large we might want the government to be or what specific programs we'd like the government to spend money on, but nobody wants the government to waste money or for the government to be defrauded. And when you look at the conversations that were going on in Congress when the bill was being considered, you could see that this was definitely on everyone's mind. And just to briefly illustrate the bipartisan appeal, uh, here's a list of the sponsor and co-sponsors of the bill in the Senate. The original, the sponsor was Tom Coburn, and the original co-sponsors were then Senator Barack Obama and Senators Carper and McCain. And of the people who were co-sponsors, you can see here I've highlighted those that are still in the Senate today and that we hope will continue to uh, have an interest in this issue and in, in overseeing the implementation of the act. So, so far I've been talking about what a great act this is and, and how useful it could be for everyone to be able to use a Google of federal spending. But you might be wondering what the catch is. And the problem is that the agencies in charge of implementing the act have done so in very narrow ways. And primarily, the agency with uh, ultimate responsibility for implementing this is the Office of Management and Budget, although they utilize other agencies to actually uh, pass the regulations that are used to implement the act. And those agencies are the Department of Defense, the General Services Administration, and NASA. And the problem is that although the act was intended to cover uh, extremely broad categories of federal spending, um, they have limited it in a way that it only covers contractors and first tier subcontractors. And I know that that's hardly self-explanatory, so I'm going to illustrate what that actually means with an example. So suppose you worked for the Department of Homeland Security and your boss came to you and said, I need you to put out a solicitation for new uniforms because the agency is buying new uniforms. So you receive offers and you ultimately award the contract to a company who says that they will deliver X uniforms for Y dollars by a specified time. So this company with a direct contractual relationship with the government is the prime contractor, which I've symbolized here with a P. But there are many aspects to making a uniform, shoes, pants, shirt, and other things. And so you might expect that this company won't directly produce all of the elements themselves. And so they might work with subcontractors to produce parts of the uniform. 
these companies that have direct contractual relationships with the prime contractor are referred to as first tier subcontractors, which I've symbolized there with S1. But that process that I've just described could continue, and so first tier subcontractors could themselves have subcontractors, and this would be referred to as a second tier subcontractor. And this process could continue, although I've only uh, illustrated it down to the second tier. And at this point, you might be wondering then, if the law was intended, as I've said, to have a broad reach, where would these reporting requirements stop? Is it intended that if a subcontractor bought a stapler, is that something that has to be reported to the website? And Congress actually considered this question and they came up with a solution. Specifically, if a company made less than $300,000 in revenue in the previous tax year, or a transaction was valued at less than $25,000, then that company or that transaction didn't have to be reported to the website required by the Transparency Act. And so under what Congress envisioned, only a small company represented there by the smaller circle wouldn't be covered by the act, but these other activities would be. The problem with how OMB and the other agencies have implemented the act is that they cut off anything below first year subcontractors. So I have that illustrated here. And you can see already that this is, uh, they're cutting off a, a much larger quantity of information. You get a very incomplete picture of federal spending. And in fact, it could be much worse because as I said, I haven't illustrated any tiers below second tier. So we really wouldn't even know how much information is being cut off. And in fact, they've also cut off slightly more information than this um, by defining what a subcontractor is in a narrow way. So in order under the OMB's interpretation for a subcontract to qualify, it has to be associated with a particular prime contract. But if for instance, a contractor had a general supply agreement where they got a specified quantity of uniforms delivered every month, even though that supply contract might be in service of the prime contract, they wouldn't be considered a subcontractor within the meaning of the implemented Transparency Act rules. Now, I've said that the act was intended to be much broader than this, but you don't have to take my word for it. Even the agencies that are implementing that act agree with me. And you can see this here in this quote that I found in the Federal Register. Although the Transparency Act reporting requirements flow down to all subcontracts, regardless of tier, OMB directed that the federal acquisition regulation be amended to limit the reporting of subcontract awards to the contractor's first year subcontractors. In other words, although the act requires that the uh, requirements flow down to all subcontracts regardless of tier, OMB told the agencies not to and the agencies didn't do so because of that, which is a very frank and rather stunning admission to put into the federal register for anyone to see. And it's very clear that the people who were discussing this when it was still a bill agreed that the reporting requirements should be much broader than simply first tier subcontractors. And you might remember that I said that Senator McCain and then Senator Obama were original co-sponsors of the act. And they discussed this specific issue in a subcommittee hearing. And Senator McCain said, it's the taxpayer's dollars. I think we should track the taxpayer's dollars to their ultimate end. In other words, the money should be tracked to the ultimate recipient instead of an artificial tier limitation the way OMB has implemented the act. And Senator Obama didn't give a pithy quote about it, but he made it very clear that he agreed with Senator McCain and I wanted to specifically note that as well. So to wrap up my portion of the talk today, I just wanna highlight that the act is very versatile and Although it was passed in a context where the primary concern was waste, fraud, and abuse, you've heard today about um, specific areas where it's already been useful and where it could be even more useful in the future. Areas like, you, uh, like human rights uh, situations or by American laws. Unfortunately, the implementation has fallen short and OMB and the other agencies have implemented it in a way that doesn't allow the act to live up to its full potential. In fact, the act requires reporting of all subcontracts, regardless of tier, a fact which the agencies themselves have admitted in the Federal Register. And so now that I've wrapped up, I'm gonna hand it back over to Bob. Thank you, Joe. I'll conclude our webinar by pointing you to the next steps we're 
thinking about for the project. OMB is perhaps not moving ahead with transparency because of a lack of demand to do so. So to demonstrate that there is interest both in civil society and in Congress, uh, we're contemplating a process of circulating letters that explain to NGOs the original purpose of the Transparency Act, how useful it is in mapping uh, U.S. government supply chains for purposes of determining whether the government is sourcing goods from high-risk countries uh, and following up on that letter. Um, so uh, look for outreach by ICAR and the Harrison Institute uh, that you might be able to participate in in terms of this NGO letter. We're also talking about the process after a action, national action plan is re released. Uh, in the spring of 2016, the United States government is putting together a national action plan on responsible business conduct, which will mention, we are told, uh, transparency, but which will not, we expect, deal with any significant improvements over the status quo. So the basic idea here is that with this first national action plan, the U.S. government will create a benchmark. What is the status quo of government regulation and, and procurement rules, and how can that serve as the place we start and build upon? to improve transparency in the future. Uh, next, we'll be following up on our own research on the transparency gaps. We'll be attempting to quantify uh, more precisely the extent to which the United States government sources its goods and services from high-risk countries and the extent to which uh, there is a gap in transparency under the Act of 2006. And finally, we've engaged in conversations with offices on Capitol Hill and the Human Rights Caucuses in both the Senate and the House for purposes of congressional oversight. It was, after all, the Act of Congress that established these obligations for transparency in the federal government, and Congress remains the primary forum uh, to assure that the law is fully implemented. We look forward to talking to you about these next steps, and with that, I will conclude our webinar for today, and uh, you have our best wishes. <laughs>